Saints. I can't imagine you're not talking about all saints in some way, but about just all saints, yeah. okay, and the Holy Spirit and Pentecost, and this is the first time we're meeting this year, so we have a lot to catch up, catch up with. It's really a great pleasure to see you. Although it took me about four hours to get here, a lot of traffic. <laughs> New York is always a traffic problem, but uh, thank God, Saint Paul didn't have a car or a jet or anything like that. They walked. So sometimes we forget those things, don't we, Father? You know, when for him to get to somewhere to, to teach, it would take him days of walking. Uh, it was very dangerous, uh, obviously, through using boats and so mostly on foot. I got a very nice email. As you remember, I went to Australia uh, about a year and a half ago. And after I went there, I, I had about a thousand Revelation books that were a little bit slow moving. And we were thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with these? Because well, you know, my publisher also has about five, 6,000. And then I thought, after I met the people at St. Paul in um, Sydney, Andrew and his family and uh, Maria, his sister, they have a wonderful missionary bookstore and uh, they have been providing the whole Sydney area with a lot of books that they uh, bring from Greece. So I had a really good relationship with them over the years. And when I went there, they uh, arranged a number of talks. So I would just read very quickly for the glory of God, uh, some of these words that Maria just sent me a couple days ago. Dear Constantine, there are so many people walking in off the street yeah, walking up the street. <laughs> Stop walking in now. <laughs> so this is in the bookstore now in Sydney, Australia. There are so many people walking in off the street who have never been to our bookstore and just love it. So many seeking Christ. Bibles are flying out the door. This is in Australia now. These are not all Greeks. Some customers are buying six Bibles at a time. Wow. I mean, I, I can't believe it. Prayer books are moving very quickly, especially the Psalter, the Psalteri in Greek, and many more in English. Many people are wanting to read the Patristics, Early Fathers. I am teaching many customers how to light, or how to light a candili, the vigilant, in the house, how to use incense, and how to use the prayer rope. Mm. Antiochian priests are telling me they are surprised with a great number of people attending their Bible study or book club classes. Adult baptisms are great in number mm. in Australia. People walk in saying, I'm an atheist. I'd like to buy a Bible. Or talk about their dissatisfaction with their Protestant and even some, not so many Roman Catholic church, the Pope, etc. I am continually writing out or emailing links to talks in Greek or English, including yours, of course, or writing down names of priests, the re-Orthodox ones. Sorry, Father. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> we shouldn't judge like that, Maria, but because <laughs> we really don't know the inside of people. And lay people have a, uh, they have the ability to do that. You know, they should. They yeah. have that freedom. Yeah, they have the freedom. And uh, what was that word? Re-orthodox. The, the real orthodox. Oh, ones. Real orthodox. <laughs> real orthodox. The real orthodox ones. I, I believe the she means she wants to say the traditional ones. Yeah. The tra the ones who believe in the tradition of the Father. Sophia, how are you? Good. Well, we ran out of the CDs of your talks. Mm -hmm. 
and Andrew is making more, and I now have customers asking me for them. The flourish of Orthodox is truly wonderful to see. I feel so blessed that I can talk about Christ all day. Wow. Many are asking about Revelation Volume 5, so would you please make would you please make these customers very happy and send us a few cases? Okay. <laughs> so that's from Australia. And um, wow. I think they suffered greatly. I, I remember in Melbourne they're closed for months. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. you know, the the uh, the measures were incredible. So, uh, at times they were not allowed to leave the house, they could only go out to buy groceries for half an hour a day. You know. Draconian measures, it was just yeah. incredible. It looks like we have a little Pentecost in, uh, in Australia, which is a, a wonderful thing. So sometimes God will allow these difficulties because through affliction, we seek the Lord. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, when everything is going well, when our life is in order, whenever we don't need God, we use Him like a spare tire. Whenever our life goes a little flat, then we just got to go check yeah. in the trunk. This is how we use God, unfortunately. So we don't have that kind of luxury right now. I believe the time that's coming upon us is the time to confess Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. The fruit of the Pentecost is Yayi Pandas, all the saints. So we have Pentecost being the birthday of the church, although the church existed uh, before all ages. We have the Church of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But here on earth, the birthday of the church is Pentecost. And this reminds me when a bishop comes out and uh, he holds the uh, vikira and the trikira and he says, Lord, look down uh, and see Father visit Prop- and visit this that vineyard have- that your right hand has planted. And this is the vineyard that his right hand has planted is the church. This vineyard will continue to exist until the very end of times. And a liturgy will be taking place until the very end of times. And we have to keep remembering that because sometimes we think that where's the church and, you know, why are these things happening? And the church will always be here. We have to make the distinction between the people in the church, the members of the church, which is all of us, we're very weak, we're very fallen. And then we have the church, which is the body of Christ, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So last week, we witnessed the descent of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is third person of the Holy Trinity, and the Holy Trinity uh, is really no numbers, but we say these things conventionally. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's no first and second and third. These are just for us to be able to communicate. It's the mystery of the Holy Trinity. And after the resurrection, after 40 days, Christ promised us that the other paraclete will come. Obviously, the apostles wanted to keep him here forever. But it says, it is to your best interest that I go. Because when I go, then the Holy Spirit will come, the other paraclete. One of the proofs that Christ is the true God, he is the Son of God, is that the Holy Spirit did come. If Christ was not the Son of God, as the Pharisees said, then the Holy Spirit would not come in the world. So the coming of the Holy Spirit and all these promises and all these prophecies that we read in the Old Testament and all these beautiful prayers. You know, last week when the priest was reading the prayers and I was following them on my, uh, I don't know what happened to me, but now I use an iPad when I chant sometimes because I wanted to follow all the all the prayers. Technology is just uh, unfortunately finding its way in the church. But I, I just, I kept following these prayers, these words in Greek, the overall composition and the beauty of these prayers. And I was thinking, I was saying, this is not human. This is not human language. You know, this is the language of God. This is the language of the Holy Spirit. These prayers are unrepeatable. They are incredible. One of these prayers, it just beautifully says, We have sinned against you. Yes, but we only worship you. We did not raise our hands to another God. 
And the other email that I got, and uh, I don't know how it came to my mind, it was about how can a mason return to the church? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was the other email that I just got from one of my uh, YouTube uh, followers, and he says, uh, "Constantine, can you do a podcast on this?" Uh-huh. <laughs> I said, uh, "I said I, I don't know enough about the masons. I did I did study enough about them a long time ago, but I, I don't think that's really a great issue because they are dinosaur. Uh, I don't think young people." Are really that interested in, in this institution right now you can see that they're selling some of the buildings so the other thing is they used to be in some of in our area they used to be on the second level mm-hmm. but now they can't walk because most of them are the poor mm-hmm. things are their 80s and 90s so they, they closed the, the second level and they came to the first level which is a good sign not that but the fact that are selling their um Masonic. They're place. selling them, of course. In, in, yeah. Yes. In well, Texas, which is, I've seen that. Yes. Like, why, why are they selling so much Masonic? Aprons yeah. and hats, I've seen it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but in that case, when a Christian becomes a Mason, he does raise his arms mm. to a different God, whether he realizes it or not. Oh. Unfortunately, most of them don't know it. A lot of these people do that because of financial gain, because they do not have an energized baptism. So we feel for them. They were deluded because of their passions. They wanted to become successful. I know many people who received positions. They were promoted because of that. Well, they will give you loans, anything you want. They helped each other greatly. I believe in a situation like that, that person needs to be re-chrismated. He needs to come back to church with chrismation. Although some people don't want to acknowledge that, they believe that Masons are Christians, they can be Masons, and it's just a philanthropic. No, if you read some of their promises that they make, and some of their literature, their God is not Jesus Christ, their God is the great architect of the universe. That's their God. As a matter of fact, uh, their God is basically Lucifer. They say very openly that they are a Luciferian religion. Really? So, yes, absolutely. They believe that the God of knowledge is Lucifer. The, the apple phone, when you have that eaten apple, it's we will give you the knowledge. That's the knowledge. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. We gave that knowledge to Adam and Eve, and we can also give it to you yeah. <laughs> via the iPhone. Have another bite. That's what they're saying. Can I ask a question? Yes. This is the first time I've ever heard anybody say that somebody should be re chrismated. Are there other times in life where people, you could say their love of money, that their, the money becomes God, that they worship right. money, mm-hmm. but not to the same extent. I've never heard anybody say that somebody needs to be re Is right. that true? I mean, is that true? In the Orthodox Church, we say that it is hundreds of times better to be the worst sinner than to go into heresy and follow another god. When you sin with the first four commandments, you're sinning directly against God. You know, it's a much higher of a sin if uh, if we do not confess Christ. If we are in a restaurant because we are embarrassed, we don't make our Cross. Now, I will give you an example. There was a monk, 4th century monk, disciple of Paisios the Great, who just commemorated, I believe, a few days ago, Saint Paisios. The young monks would have to uh, go out once a month or so to sell baskets, to go and sell it and get some of their sustenance. So he's walking and uh, there's a group of Jewish people that they're walking along and they, they started a conversation with him, trying to tell him, look, Christ wasn't God and he didn't want to talk too much with them. And he just said, okay, maybe he wasn't. Just to just close their mouth. So he went to the market and he sold his uh, handiwork. And then he went back home to his yelda, to Paisios. And he says, who are you? I don't recognize you. I I am your disciple. No, no, my my disciple was a Christian. I I don't see the grace of baptism on you now. I mean, St. Isaac the Syrian speaks about these different states of spirituality. He speaks about the carnal state, and then he speaks about the state of illumination, and then he speaks about the spiritual state, which is a very high state. And at that state, they can actually see the energy of baptism. They can see the Holy Spirit on a person. 
and they can see, they can tell if someone is baptized or not. And St. Paisio saw that and he said, you're not baptized. You lost your baptism. So he was chrismated and he had to do a great deal of disciplinary work to try to attract the grace of the Holy Spirit back. So well, the gospel tomorrow is a very serious, serious gospel. When it begins, unless you, if you do not confess me in front of people, I will not confess confess you in front of my Father in heaven. Anyone who denies me in front of people, I will also deny him in front of my Father in heaven. And St. Gregory Palama says, look, even if you make a confession, and uh, let's say you die for Christ, you make a confession in front of 20, 30, 40, 50 people, but look at the glory waiting for us. When Christ confesses us in front of his Father, it'll be done in front of the whole universe from the beginning, from Adam until the very last person on earth. He will confess that this person is mine. They confess my name. Nick is mine. Sophia is mine. Antonio is mine. And that kind of confession is going to radiate through the whole universe. That's what St. Gregor Valama says about tomorrow's great day. Because we all celebrate tomorrow. Because all our saints celebrate tomorrow especially the Panagia. It's the feast day for all of us tomorrow. And the Panagia, who's higher than the heavens, higher than cherubim and the seraphim. And all the saints celebrate. And Father Philotheus Zervakos, another spiritual child of uh, St. Nectarius, soon to be, to be enlisted is really the right term, to be enlisted as a saint. He's already a saint, but the church will officially enlist him. We don't canonize saints. <clears throat> They do that in the West, the Pope does. The church acknowledges and enlists the existing saint. Father Philotheo Zavakos was a great saint. He went from Paros to Thessaloniki. He was teletransported because there was no ship to take him there. And he was very sad because St. Demetrius saved him from death. The Turks got him because he did disobedience to St. Nectarius. St. Nectarius said, no, no, don't go to Mount Athos. You don't have to. And he didn't realize that that was really an obedience. And he thought it was just a suggestion. So when he said, uh, you don't have to go to Mount Athos, he said, well, I'll go anyway. So he went. He goes to Saloniki. He gets apprehended by some Turks. They accuse him to be a spy or something. And uh, he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. Then St. Demetrius flies over with his, with his horse, opens the jail, gets him out, and saves him. And then after that, he promises to be at the church of St. Demetrius in Thessaloniki every year. And he did. But one year, the sea it was so tempestuous, it was so bad that there was nothing, nothing moving. So he sat in his cell, and he was just praying and saying, St. Demetrius, I made that promise, but sorry, there's nothing I can do. I just, you know, he stayed there, kind of sad. And then all of a sudden, he found himself in the middle of the altar of St. Demetrius. And nobody knew anything. He just kind of, you know, <laughs> appeared. <laughs> <laughs> and then he did the all-night vigil, he celebrated, and then after that, how did he go back? Same way? Same way? Same. No. The, the waters had calmed down? He took the boat. <laughs> 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 God will not do a miracle That's if right. it's not necessary, okay? No, no, I mean, if you, if you could go by a boat, God will not take him the other way. So he took the boat. Okay, these are the saints. These are the saints that decorate the church. Now, Saint Nicodemus wrote the, the hymn of all the saints. Olivada's fathers, they loved, they loved this feast. Everywhere they went, after they were expelled from Mount Athos, I think we did a homily here about them. After they left and they went all over the islands, they built so many little churches of Aion Pandon. And the one that Father Philotus of Rakosar was Don Aion Pandon, of all the saints, on the top of the hill, on top of the mountain. So it's a wonderful feast because it shows the gospel is a living gospel. The church, the tradition of the church, 
church is alive. The proof that our church is alive and the true vine is that to this day it produces the fruit of sainthood. I haven't heard of a hundred saints in Italy last century. I heard of a Mother Teresa who was canonized and uh, a faithful woman. But just last century, we had over a hundred, a hundred saints in Greece alone. Osseus. Now, I'm not talking about the martyrs last century. We had millions of martyrs in Russia. The blood of the saints is keeping this world going and bringing the mercy of God on all of us. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what happens in a divine liturgy. So divine liturgy is the combination of us here on earth with heaven, with the heaven. We are one body. We have the church militant here, and we connect, we become united, one body with a church triumphant in heaven. Amazing things that we don't see. A lot of our saints, they saw angels walking in the altar, like Yaakov of St. Yaakov of Salikis, who would say, excuse me, Mr. Angel, I, I can't get through. <laughs> the angels were walking his way, he would say, look, and he was so polite, excuse me, Mr. Angel, uh, I have to go out now. <laughs> People do see them. My, Let's see them. My brother-in-law saw one yeah. who was a priest. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing things in our church. But we have to strengthen our faith and we have to read the lives of the saints. We really need to stop focusing on YouTube. And there's some good, but we have to stop focusing on all that noise, all that noise pollution, and begin to concentrate on how to re-energize the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is why we have Pentecost every year. This is why we have resurrection every year, mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. The first day of resurrection in monasteries, they chant Christos Anesti 99 times, all through the services, all through the day. Over and over and over and over again. Christos Anesti, Christos Anesti. Because we are forgetful. We have that fallen human nature. So we do this every year. And we saw how after the Sunday of uh, the tax collector and the Pharisee, we have the moving feasts of the church. So the birth of St. John the Baptist, is on the 24th with a new calendar and 13 days later with the old calendar. So that's a stable feast. Christmas is on the 25th. Pascha moves and we have the moving feasts that start from Triodion and they end tomorrow with the Sunday of all the saints. And as I said earlier, we have to confess Christ because all these martyrs were confessors. They confess Christ, not just with their lips, but how did they get to confess Christ? Because they were full of the Holy Spirit. Saint Luke loves that more so than all the other apostles, all the other evangelists and writers of the, uh, of the New Testament. St. Luke repeats, a man full of the Holy Spirit, talks about Stephen. And uh, uh, Elizabeth became full of the Holy Spirit. And then again, uh, in Cyprus, St. Paul became full of the Holy Spirit. These people were full of the Holy Spirit, and they became confessors and martyrs. But how about us? What do we do in this century that we live in? God prepared us. As we said, last, last century, we had over 100 saints in Greece alone, saintly people. You heard of uh, Evmenios and Saint Nikiforos and Argyro. I put something on YouTube, a young woman named Argyro. What a beautiful story. And her friends were all lepers. And this is what these women did. They vowed to God at the leprosy hospital outside of Athens. They said, Lord, if the medicine for leprosy is discovered, we promise to fast all our lives, not to eat meat ever or anything. We'll just live on vegetables and we'll fast forever. These are women, lay people. This is the kind of vow that they made. After this, even though they were sick, they were missing limbs, they were missing eyes, ears, you know, terrible sight, they were ill. They did austere fasting. And then I think St. Anthemos reprimanded them, told them, now listen, it's not permissible for you to fast on Pascha. You cannot fast on Pascha. Go to the vigil lamp, dip your index finger there, get some oil from the vigil lamp, put it on your lips, and you're good. <laughs> How do you like that? Mm. Huh? To celebrate Pascha with just, just one lick of oil and boiled potatoes. Not even an egg. Okay. No eggs. Not even a red egg. No eggs. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> 
So this is what we don't have today. We don't have that sacrificial spirit. There's a beautiful statement about the Holy Spirit in the life of the patristic literature, the Holy Fathers. Vose ili yanalavis pnevma. Can you translate that, Father? Ili, give something and receive the spirit. Okay. Oil is the only oil? Yeah. Yeah. Give ili. What's ili? Oil. 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 Flesh. Oh, no, that's wrong. Difficult word. Ili is matter, like things, things that we consume, possessions. Ilistis in Greek is a materialist. Mm -hmm. So what the uh, Holy Fathers are saying is, limit the intake of matter and things and possessions, limit those, and then you'll receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And how do we do that? Initially, from fasting. That's what fasting is. St. Isaac the Syrian speaks about continuous fasting. I mean, look what happened during Great Lent. How were we feeling? The mind is clear, you know, the the thoughts are few and uh, basically harmless. And the minute we begin to consume everything under the sun, cheese steaks and pizza pies and this and ice cream, and, and then all of a sudden we yawn, we can't pray, everything is limited, and uh, we're back to normal. Because we think, oh, okay, it's great land, now it's over, we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> but the idea of great land, according to St. John of Christ, is to get the motor running. The idea is, okay, he says, fasting is over now, but piety must continue and remain. And gratia, self-control, is something permanent for us Christians. And we forget that. And then all of a sudden, summer comes, and we're totally unprotected spiritually. So those ili give of material things to invite in spirituality, the Holy Spirit. And that is true not just with fasting, but also to give things that belong to us, to share with the poor. Almsgiving, it protects us from greed. Because if we don't do that, you know, we become selfish, self-centered. So when we constantly reduce not only our food intake, but also our entertainment intake, carnal lifestyle. As we reduce that, then we will, of course, we will add virtues and increase prayer. Then we will begin to energize the Holy Spirit, which we received during our baptism. The saints did not receive anything more during their baptism. The mysteries are all the same. We all receive the same grace. But we don't have the orthodox lifestyle. There's certain asceticism in the church. Unfortunately, now we cut the fast of the apostles, I think, just tomorrow, one day, with a new calendar. (laughs) And you see, the church gives us, because the church knows our nature extremely well. We had great Lent, and then we have a little bit of a break, and then we have the fasting of the apostles, which is pretty much like the fasting of Christmas. But because of the change of the calendar, sometimes it can be 30 days, sometimes it can be one day, like tomorrow. This Monday will be the only day, and after that, Tuesday, we have St. Peter and Paul. Our fast is a little longer. (laughs) <laughs> it's two weeks. <laughs> Fourteen. Yeah, you can get a blessing from your, you know, from your spiritual father and say, I would like to uh, just cut down a few things. I'd like to be a vegetarian for a few weeks, but always with a blessing. And we can do that any time. If we see that, you know, our mouth is talking too much or we're getting too frustrated, too angry, something's not right. And then after that, we have the August fast. And then after that, we have the Christmas fast. And after that, we have 30 days and we have Great Lent, Triodion. So one after the other. And this is a lot more serious, of course, for those who give 100%, the monastics. You know, when we read the writings of St. Isaac the Syrian, of course, they are a little bit more uh, for monks. But we can also benefit from those readings because fasting helps everyone, everyone. Self-control is actually one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And St. Paul starts from the highest one, which is love. But St. John of the Ladder leaves that for last. You have to go through all the other steps before you go to sacrificial and perfect love, Christian love. So we re-energize the Holy Spirit when we exercise self-control. Of course, when we keep the commandments. Keeping the commandments is really how we come to the love of Christ, who is the one who loves me, the one who keeps my commandments. And that includes many commandments, forgiveness and uh, not judging and being compassionate and all the things that we read in the scriptures. But I think what we lack today is this sacrificial spirit. God wants us to sacrifice our own 
own will for our brother. The sacrificial spirit, the, the mystical theology of St. Paul in Romans chapter 12, I believe, verse 1. He says, I ask you, my brothers, to present your bodies, to present not just your soul, but to present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Sounds difficult. To sacrifice our will for the other person. To sacrifice in our turn. When we see somebody that's in a hurry. To say, here, go in front of me. Sacrifice <laughs> our time for the other person. To sacrifice our entertainment. And go look after an older person. Someone who's shut in. That's what we don't do enough today. I mean, we go to church. We pray. We read our prayers. We read books. But we need that <coughs> sacrificial spirit. This is the patience of the saints, and these are fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, we have some virtues, but the fruits of the Holy Spirit are totally different. The love of the Holy Spirit is totally different than what we call love. The peace of the Holy Spirit is a little bit different than the peace that we feel sometimes. It takes presuppositions to be able to get to that level. And this is what the saints teach us by reading their lives we benefit greatly. Let's not be jealous of their feats and uh, because they, they didn't do these things on their own either. They, they had the will, they had the desire, but 99% of their work belonged to God. The miracles that they do, they're not theirs. They simply had the burning desire to please God, to do His will. But we're lukewarm today. We like the gospel, we like paradise, of course, but we also like our lifestyle. We like the things of the world. So we go back and forth. And we go up to the point where, okay, it's not a total sin yet. I can stop right there. And to think that, oh, Wednesday and Friday, fasting again. Of course, it's a little bit difficult in the beginning. But after we develop the habit, just like everything else, it takes via. What's the Greek word via? I don't like the uh, translation in the uh, King James. The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I don't know how else to translate it. But what it means is the kingdom of God is not for lukewarm people, for people who are nonchalant. What do you think, honey? Should we go to church this Sunday? Yeah. No, nah, we won last Sunday. You know, we'll go, we'll go next Sunday. Constantine. Yes. I was reading um, St. Siloan, the Adonite. And it was saying that another way to access the Holy Spirit is via gratitude to God. Gratitude. gratitude. And Paisios is the same thing. Yeah. Yes. To just thank God, and uh, especially when we are not feeling well. We receive incredible grace when we're hurting, when we are ill. And instead of saying, why me? Instead of saying, glory to God, let God's will be done. But this is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit makes people fearless, makes people totally surrender their life to God. Let us commit one another and all our life to Christ our God. We pray that at every divine liturgy. But for us to do that by ourselves, we can't. We cannot do that without the grace of God and especially the prayers of the Panagia. And that's why right after that prayer, we call for the prayers of the Panagia at that point in the liturgy. So in tomorrow's gospel, we will be using two, three different chapters. That's kind of rare. You know, and the fathers do that. They will take verses from chapter 10 of Matthew tomorrow. I think 32, 33. And I already mentioned that. Whoever confesses me in front, in front of people, I will also confess him. And then it goes to another verse. Whoever loves father, mother, son, daughter, husband, and wife, more than me is not worthy of me. It's not worthy of me. In other words, we'll not be able to be my martyr. Because if we love our relatives in an absolute manner, then we are tied on earth. In the liturgy, we say, Anos homen tas And whatever is holding us here on earth, what are these things that fly near the balloons that do advertising? Have sand holding them down or some, some kind of weight. And then they cut it and then it yeah. begins to go up. The more idols we have here on earth, the more grounded we are. Mm -hmm. And this is why Christ says, do not make an idol out of your father, brother, sister, wife, husband. These people are relative to you. So you love them relatively. Mm -hmm. 
If you give your heart to them in an absolute way, you will not be able to take off. At the second resurrection, your body will not be able to take off to meet the Lord in the air. That was the problem with Israel in the Old Testament. They would fall into idolatry constantly. So we don't idolize those around us. Remember the, uh, or the uh, Great Supper? The invitation went out. And one of the excuses was, uh, have me excuse, I just got married. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to idolize my wife for a while, and when I'm done with her, then I'll think about you. Same thing with the, uh, with the five virgins. They had other things to do. The bridegroom was not on their mind, the five foolish virgins. They did not have absolute love for the bridegroom, or their lamps would be lit. They became lukewarm. Makarios odulos onevresi grigorunda, egrigosis, to be vigilant. My body is asleep, but my heart is awake. The spiritual giants who practice the Jesus prayer, they can be sleeping, but their heart repeats the prayer. So we have to be vigilant, and at the same time, we have to realize that as sinful people, we will fall. Humility is very important in the Orthodox Church. The Pharisee had all the virtues, but he was not justified. Tax collector, he had all the vices. He was greedy, nasty, but at that moment, he was repenting. He came to humility. He was beating his chest. And he walked out of the temple justified, at least for that day. Now, hopefully, he continued <laughs> okay, for the rest of his life. Because we can live a spiritual life for a number of years. There comes a time when we think, okay, now we know enough. We got it. I got this. I got it. <laughs> when you say, I got it, you don't have it. Just like the bishop in Revelation. You have left your first love. Your first love. Your absolute love who was Christ and the church. Because after a year or two, you know, you repeat things over and over again. Father Michael saw there's a, a good saying about priests. The first year, the, first, yeah, yeah. the, the, the first year, the first year, the priest is afraid of God, and the second year, God becomes afraid of the priest. <laughs> <laughs> if the priest is not careful and it becomes something common, ah, just another liturgy. Every liturgy is fresh, every liturgy is different. So There's not a single liturgy that's the same. St. Paul says, Do not put out. Do not put out the flame of the Holy Spirit. And the way we put it out is by not following the commandments, by not following the basics, by forgetting to pray. Oh, I'm just not going to pray tonight. I'm a little bit too tired. I don't feel well. That's where we have to force ourselves. We have to force our weak human nature. We have to exercise the discipline on ourselves to forgive the person that may have just hurt us and uh, we exchange some words and if we may not feel like it but if we don't forgive them we cannot take Holy Communion. Christ is very direct. We don't forgive even one person. We're not worthy of Christ. He forgave those who crucified him, those who spat upon him, those who mocked him. And just because we had a misunderstanding with our neighbor, no, I'm not going to talk to her again. Mm. And I, I see people who have been going to church all their lives, and they're so easy to have a misunderstanding, which shows that we can do the external. We can go to church, go through the motions, but if we don't have fruits of the Holy Spirit, then we're like that fig tree on Holy Monday night. The tree had roots, it had stamps, it had uh, bark, it had, uh, it had leaves, obviously. All those things are good, but no fruit. In a final analysis, Christ is going to be looking for his image on us. We mentioned this many times in these lessons in the last seven, eight, nine years. What is the second coming? It's simple, a very quick x-ray. If the characteristics of our heart match those of Christ in the gospel, then we're his. But if in that spiritual x-ray, we find malice, unforgiveness, little greed, different loves in our heart then the demons are going to say, wait a second, that person looks like us. He's our friend. Come, come, come this way. So Christ is not going to judge anyone. We're going to judge ourselves. And that's why we judge ourselves in this life. When we go to Holy Confession, we judge ourselves. If we judge ourselves all through our lives, through Holy Confession, then when we die, we will not be judged. That's what Christ says. Those who believe in me, 
and the one who sent me. There's no death for them. They cross over from death to life. They will not be judged. And may God forgive me, but sometimes I see um, non-Orthodox coming into the Orthodox uh, faith. Um, and where we are in Dallas, as an example, there's a lot of converts. It's, it's sure. wonderful what's going on there in terms of people uh, converting into the Orthodox faith. All colors, or all, all races. Yes, it's yes, just yes, an yes, uh, I hear that in many churches. Yeah. It's wonderful. Uh, but they're not baptized. Mm -hmm. And just I'm just, you know, I've asked the innocent question in terms yeah. of well, why, wouldn't you, why wouldn't you be baptized? Well, we, on the topic... Um, when I, we asked the question, well, were you baptized? And the answer from the convert, beautiful lady, very, very uh, religiously, she says, no, I wasn't. I wasn't, I wasn't told to be baptized. And the theology of the church is that we don't recognize any other baptism. So to say that, oh, they were already baptized, so we're just going to chrismate them, that is a convenient explanation for those who are not uh, theologically astute. How did you get a baptism if you don't have priesthood? Exactly. Without priesthood, how can you have baptism? How can you have sacraments? Yes, exactly. How can you have sacraments without, without priesthood? Yeah, and yeah. if you don't have priesthood, then you don't have any sacraments. There are priests that, were, that so, we have in Dallas that were just chrismated. So the answer the is that the church does not recognize their baptism. The church can embody that person on the body of Christ by chrismation. And we don't want to judge uh, the, the converts because they don't know any better mm -hmm. and uh, they come into the church and God will certainly give them yeah. you know, his grace and uh, they'll continue to work out their salvation. <laughs> Simon, O Consofus, Tu Sanis, Nadixas, Catantem Sans Aptis, Tu Pnevma, Tu Aio, Que Diaton, Sanginesas, Pilantro, Pilantro, 